Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class, a production of iHeartRadio's How Stuff Works. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Holly Fry. And I'm Tracy V. Wilson. Uh, Tracy, we recently had a listener mail that requested lawn games as a topic. Yeah, I think we read that on the air. Yeah, and then I couldn't get it out of my head. (laughs) Also, Atlanta is having a freakishly warm winter so far. We had snow this past weekend, but today it's in the 60s. Yeah, I was just there for a quick visit (laughs) and was like, wow, it is sticky springtime right now, even though it is at that point January. Yeah, It was January or February. Now, see, it's all blurred together. It is. Um, There are a lot of confused plants trying to bloom at my house. Mm -hmm. (laughs) My lawn is having a pretty significant identity crisis where it is also trying to grow, and then the weeds are coming in. Uh, So it actually kind of does seem like a weird spring here, even though I know a cold snap is coming anytime, but it it does put me in the mind of lawn games. I'm going to invent a new sport called, um, like, winter croquet, which is what we're talking about today, because (laughs) as I started looking at lawn games, croquet kind of took the lead in terms of available information. Um, I still would love to do a survey of other ones, but there was so much interesting stuff about croquet that I wanted to talk about it, because while the origins of it are really, really cloudy, and we're going to talk about that, there have been plenty of books written on the subject in the last 150 years, many of which are very charming and sort of funny from the modern perspective. So to start, let's cover just the basic rules of croquet as it's played today. The regulation size for a court is 100 by 50 feet. That's roughly 30 by 15 meters. Although for casual play, the dimensions can be altered to suit the available space. I hang out with a lot of casual but very dedicated croquet players, and boy, oh boy, do we have some non-standard play sizes. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> in my social circle. Uh, the space is usually marked out with stakes or string. And wickets are placed in the space to create a pointed figure eight shape with a wicket at each point. And at the top and the bottom of this figure eight, there are two croquet wickets placed close to one another with a stake at the very top and bottom of the arrangement. This arrangement uh, uses a total of nine wickets. The play starts at the bottom of this figure eight, and every ball needs to move through each wicket, first along the right side of the diamond, up through the double wicket at the top, hitting the stake that's there, and then turning and moving back down the figure eight on the opposite side. Two teams compete, taking turns to move all their croquet balls through this configuration by tapping the balls with the ends of the mallets, not the sides. The first team to successfully get all the croquet balls through the course wins, and there are, of course, more rules than that, and a lot of house rules if you know a lot of Mm -hmm. (laughs) casual croquet players. Uh, But the basic layout is how, that's how the game works today. However, there is another uh, variation. In the U.S., a version of croquet exists using only six wickets. Uh, These are arranged so that they form two triangles that point toward the center of the established court. And uh, these can be, that court can be uh, just 50 by 40 feet. That's roughly 15 by 12 meters, so much smaller. Gameplay in the six-wicket arrangement has the balls played in kind of a spiral that starts at the outside edge to work inward for the first six points of play, and then it restarts from another point on the exterior of the wickets and moves inward for the last seven points. In an 1897 book on croquet's history, author Arthur Lilly opens with a story about a friend whose doctor told him that the crazy work-work-work lifestyle of the 1860s was making people ill. We can have a moment of a side to just laugh at how they would be terrified at the workload of most people in 2020. Uh, In this particular case, though, the explanation was that, quote, work keeps the mucous membrane of the brain in perpetual irritation. I'm going to use that excuse all the time. Uh, Fresh air was the recommended treatment. And after unsuccessfully trying out things like long walks, what really helped the patient, who was a clergyman named Dunbar Isidore Heath, was croquet. Lily went on in his writing to proclaim, quote, croquet, according to many medical men, is the healthiest game in the world, seeing that it furnishes the great desideratum of the overworked 19th century, the maximum of daily fresh air and amusement with the minimum fatigue. He also points out that the beauty of the game is its accessibility to almost anyone to play. It can be intellectually simulating as the player has to strategize, but it's not actually taxing. 
30 years prior to Arthur Lilly, a man named Walter Jones Whitmore similarly extolled the virtues and noted the appeal of croquet. In his 1868 book, Croquet Tactics, writing, quote, Considered simply as an outdoor amusement, affording healthy exercise and excitement to a number of people who only got their exercise formerly in the dull round of a constitutional walk, we are bound to confess that it has conferred an immense boon to society, which boon society gratefully acknowledges by its attachment." Then it is a game suited to every age and both sexes. This was, of course, a great element of success from the first. This same writing also mentions that croquet has an edge over both billiards and cricket because the financial barrier to entry is pretty low by comparison. It's not a luxury sport, but it's one that during nice weather can be found almost anywhere. I mean, as long as there's a spot of greenery (laughs) that's large enough. Yeah, you just need a little, little open, fairly flat piece of lawn. Anybody can play. Uh, Arthur Lilly's book also quotes the Reverend J.G. Wood's explanation of the name of this game in his work. Quote, the word croquet is derived from a French word, croquet, to crunch with the teeth. This word is used to describe the sound caused by eating anything very hard and brittle. The word is used to distinguish the game in consequence of the crackling sound of the mallets against the ball. However, though that quote is very charming, Lily then dismisses this entire explanation as complete nonsense and explains that the proto-mallets in the games that predate croquet were themselves called croquets and that that derived from the old French word croche, which translated to crooks. So the origins of games are almost always a little bit murky because a lot of these diversions start out pretty organically. They evolve over time as people make up things to do. Historically, people haven't just documented the moment when they came up with a game, for the most part. Yeah, it's not like Cones of Dunshire or <laughs> or any of, of the sort of uh, gaming trend of today where people are like, I'm going to come up with a game, and it is well documented. This is definitely more of a casual, we could hit that thing with that thing. Let's make some rules. Um, While there are variations in how the game spread and how its rules were refined, it is generally believed to have originated in Western France, Brittany specifically, as early as the 13th century. Players in this proto-croquet entertainment, according to the Croquet Foundation of America, quote, used crudely fashioned mallets to whack wooden balls through hoops made of willow branches. In the mid-1600s, the English lexiconographer Thomas Blunt described the game this way, quote, a game wherein a round bowl is with a mallet struck through a high arch of iron standing at either end of an alley, which he can do at the fewest blows or at the number agreed on wins. The game is heretofore used in the long alley near St. James's and vulgarly called (laughs) pell-mell. On April 2nd, 1661, during the restoration reign of Charles II, Samuel Pepys recorded an instance of watching the Duke of York play a game that he calls Pell-Mell. He spells it P-E-L-E-M-E-L-E. The king himself was said to love the game. And two years later, Pepys interviewed the man who looked after what Pepys is by that time calling the Pell-Mell. That's the yard used to play the game, and it's spelled the way it sounds, P-E-L-L-M-E-L-L. And the area that's used for playing was made up of a mix of earth covered with powdered cockle shells. And then the name Paul Mall is another variation of the two that are already noted in Pepys's writing. And there are others. Uh, it is possible that the mall in this case is an anglicization of maillet, which is the French word for mallet. We're going to talk a little bit more about how Paul Mall, Pell Mell, or Pi Mai was played. But first, we're going to pause for a quick sponsor break. So this game, with many names, but we'll go with Pall Mall or Pell Mell, <laughs> uh, was played in essentially a long alley. It is sometimes described as being something between golf and modern croquet. And like croquet, it included a ball, mallets with curved heads, and an arch that players tried to get the ball through the arches. 
1717, a book titled Je de May, written by Monsieur Lothier, offered instructive advice on playing technique. Quote, the body ought not to be either too straight or too much curved, but moderately inclined, so that in striking, it may be supported by the strength of the loins, while we turn it gently back from the waist upwards, raising the head without ever losing sight of the ball. So use your core strength with this and not just your arms. Yeah. Uh, Lottier also shared a story of a unique ball that was used for this game. So at this point, pell-mell balls were normally about six inches in diameter. They are made from a substance called dudgeon, and that is the root of the box tree. And that dudgeon was then beaten carefully into this ball shape. Quote, there was a ball of great renown, the history of which will perhaps not be useless or disagreeable and will show what importance in the game of mall is a good ball. A ball merchant of Provence brought a large bag of them to Ike's. The players, who were in great number in this town, bought them all at 30 sous apiece, except one only, which not being so pretty as the others was rejected. A good player named Bernard came the last and bought this waste ball, for which he would not give but 15 sous. It weighed seven ounces and two drams and was of ugly wood and half of it reddish. He played it a long time, finished it, and it became so excellent that when he had a long stroke to make, it never failed him at his need and led infallibly to his winning the match. This ball, which became famous, became known as the Bernard. And it was so coveted and renowned that its next owner refused numerous offers to purchase it, including a proposed trade in which the would-be buyer offered 30 pistols. Uh, Clearly, it's a very valuable ball. (laughs) It was, however, occasionally loaned out to famous players for matches, though. So in addition to this primary version of Pall Mall, the Lothier text also described two other variations. The first of these was something called Chacon Pall Mall, which was a lot like golf. It was played in an open field with specified targets, usually naturally occurring obstacles like trees and rocks. And instead of mallets, they used crooks. And then the third version was played a lot like billiards. Other accounts of these games suggest that they were completely different sports. In his 1897 History of Croquet, Arthur Lilly made the point that many sports, in addition to Pall Mall, including hockey and polo, had some version in their history, which was called chicane, or you'll see it sometimes called chicane. Uh, So they may have all had some sort of commonality from which they branched, evolved, and then in some cases combined with other games. He makes the case that this may be in part due to the changing seasons in Brittany, where the rudimentary game started. They would have played a version of the game that evolved into hockey in the winter and one more like golf in the spring. And as the summer got hot and movement was a lot more arduous, the limited range version that was played within an alley or a court would have become the standard. He also suggests that on the most uncomfortable days, the players might have just simply practiced their putting. I'm so hot, I only want to putt. (laughs) (laughs) Pall Mall fell out of favor in England over time, but as it declined there, it seems that some version of it was introduced to Ireland. It's unclear exactly how this sport migrated from France, but by the 1830s, it was popular in the areas around Dublin, and the rules had started to become more uniform. In the early 1850s, the game, as it had evolved in Ireland, included the basic rules that were developed there. They were exported to England, where the modern version of the game was first played with the name Crookie. Yeah, I am unclear on whether that is just an Englishman writing a snooty phonetic of how he thinks Irish people speak. Um, but <laughs> because it's literally C-R-O-O-K-Y, um, I don't know. The first retail croquet sets were also introduced during this time in the 1850s by Jean-Jacques of London, which still exists after some name shifting as Jacques of London. Their croquet set offerings on their website, which they still offer, include copy that uh, states that the company invented the sport, which is a a matter of some debate. Sure. Uh, Even early on in croquet's modern era popularity, the origin of the game was still debated. In a letter penned by a Dr. Pryor in the late 1800s on this matter, he wrote, quote, Who invented croquet or who improved a rustic game into one fit for polite society is a question that has often been asked and has never been answered. One thing only is certain. 
It is from Ireland that it came to England, and it was on the lawn of the late Lord Lonsdale that it was first played in this country. How long it had been practiced in Ireland or in what year his lordship introduced it, nobody knows. It may be presumed that it did not occur to anyone in its perfect form as we have it now, but was built up, so to say, bit by bit, with hints and contributions from many different people. Which is exactly how most things evolve in history. Uh, Pryor's position, though, was that croquet did not evolve from Pall Mall, as that game hadn't been played in so long that no one probably even remembered it enough to revive it in any sort of revised version. But one thing about croquet was entirely clear to Pryor. He wrote, quote, "...nothing but tobacco smoking has ever spread as quickly." Croquet eventually made its way to the U.S. from Europe, and it quickly became very popular here, too. From the mid-1800s up until the 1890s, its stateside appeal grew. But in the last decade of the 19th century, it was lumped in with drinking and gambling due to its popularity on Boston Common, where those other entertainments were also popular. After that, its popularity declined for several decades. Yeah, had a little uh, little smear on its identity. <laughs> I'm, so, I'm, I'm trying to think if I've ever seen people playing croquet on Boston Common, and I'm like, I don't think I've seen anyone do. Is it allowed? <laughs> right. It's because in the 1890s, they knew croquet. They caused too much trouble with the croquet on Boston right. Common. Right. They associated it with vices that were not healthy. <laughs> But beginning in the 1920s, croquet in the U.S. once again became popular as it was embraced by various celebrities at their gatherings, and it gained a fresh wave of cachet. The United States Croquet Association was founded in 1977, so it took a little while, by Jack Osborne. And he established the rules for that six-wicket, kind of abbreviated style of play that we mentioned at the top of the show. That association still exists today. In 1987, the American Croquet Association was born to support gameplay with the international rules, so with more wickets, uh, though the USCA now oversees most events that feature international rules gameplay, and there's a pretty significant overlap in membership. That Venn diagram has a a big middle section. (laughs) Next, we're going to discuss two interesting figures in croquet's history and one significant organization that has shifted away from the sport of croquet in favor of another game. Uh, We'll get to that after a word from our sponsors. One of the most prominent figures in Croquet's history is Walter Jones Whitmore, who we mentioned earlier. Whitmore was born in 1831 and became acquainted with Croquet in 1860 when he was just a young man of 29. He was working at the time as a government clerk, and he picked up the game casually, playing with the people in his neighborhood of Morton in Marsh in Gloucestershire, England. At this point, there wasn't a standardized set of rules for the game beyond a very friendly version. Different companies were producing croquet sets for recreational use, and every company had its own version of the rules that was included with the set. Whitmore recognized that if the sport was going to be taken seriously, there needed to be a clear, standardized rule set for competitive play, so he wrote some. Yeah, there were rules that have been developed, but... uh, Just a lot of them. (laughs) There's a lot of house rules for everybody that played. And as we said, different different companies that made sets made their own shifts to the rules. And he thought, like, this is a sport that could be, like, a pro sport, but it's going to need some more structure. Uh, These rules that he came up with were published by a periodical called The Field, and they came to be known as The Field Rules, or you'll sometimes see them listed as The Field Laws. And they did shift public thinking on the sport to consider it as more than just a backyard pastime. The same year that The Field Rules came out, which was 1866, Walter Jones Whitmore also published a book which uh, used a lot of the the articles that he had written to establish these, these rules, and that was called The Science of Croquet. In 1867, Whitmore established England's first croquet tournament, which he also won. That championship status led to his book, Croquet Tactics. He explained in the introduction, quote, The present volume is a compilation of my articles, which appeared in that journal, The Field, although considerably enlarged and with the addition of several points which have since occurred to me. He next established the All England Croquet Club, and after failing to secure a permanent home for the AECC, he next founded a second All England Croquet Club, which became the National Croquet Club, 
Both of these clubs worked together with Whitmore's leadership to refine the sport rules further in subsequent years, and then he died in 1872 at the age of 41. Women's involvement in the game of croquet has been touted almost as long as the sport has existed under that name. One of the selling points of croquet, as we mentioned at the top of the episode, is that it is something that many people can do because it is not especially physically demanding. Caricaturist John Leach made engravings in the 1860s featuring ladies playing croquet alongside gentlemen. In his 1862 etching a croquet match, a large group of people is playing, including several women. As the women are leaning forward playing the game, their large cage crinolines lift their dresses so they slightly expose the petticoats that are underneath. Leach's 1865 piece titled A Nice Game for Two or More shows a garden party with a woman preparing a shot as she looks at one of her male opponents. The caption for this image reads, Fixing her eyes on his and placing her pretty little foot on the ball, she said, Now then, I am going to croquet you. And croqueted he was completely. The Arthur Lilly history we've referenced several times even mentions in interpreting a poem about croquet that lists a number of other sports, quote, all these games are inferior to croquet for they exclude ladies. And there was, incidentally, a nickname for an adaptation of the game, which was called crinoline croquet, but that didn't really have anything to do with women, so I just want to, like, clarify on that in case you come across it. This was just the game played on a smaller scale with smaller implements. This version was apparently considered far less serious by more devoted players of the game, but it was also the reason that its popularity spread so quickly, as it could be played even on tiny backyard lawns. It was also where, according to Lily's estimate, 90% of enthusiasts were playing. This is, again, not the professional tournament version, but the more casual version. And it was really that version that came across the Atlantic and became popular in the U.S. But there's one woman in particular who had a surprising rise to fame as a croquet player. Her name was Lily Gower, and she was Welsh. In 1898, at the age of 21, the relatively inexperienced Gower entered a tournament in Budley, which is a coastal town in East Devon, England. Yeah, she had never played in public before, and after a fairly boring run of the beginning of the tournament, it ended up that the newcomer Gower was up against Mr. C.E. Willis, a champion player for the finals. The finals were a best-of-three situation. Lily had been categorized as having beginner's luck by most people in attendance. But in the first round of play against the veteran Willis, she beat him. And in the second game, which was heavily attended after Gower's success in the first game, Willis came back and played incredibly well, beating the young woman easily. So it appeared that Lily's luck had run out. But in the third game, she trounced Willis, winning in just 35 minutes with a 26-point lead. So while there were still detractors that chalked all this up to just good luck on her part, that was really the beginning of a successful career in the sport for her. Uh, Lily Gower went on to win a lot of championships. Yeah, she also ended up married to another croquet player, which I love. Uh, There is also another name in croquet's history that I would bet is very familiar to most of our listeners, which is Wimbledon. The sport that you probably think of when you hear that name is tennis, with good reason, But Wimbledon was actually associated with croquet first. We're going to jump back first to the Walter Jones Whitmore story. He had, as we just mentioned, founded the All England Croquet Club in 1868, four years before his death. We mentioned that he had some difficulty finding a permanent home for the club. And once that was finally secured, it was near the Wimbledon train station. The station name and the club became totally intertwined. In 1875, the club, in an effort to stay relevant and to capitalize on another sport that was gaining in popularity, changed its name to the All England Croquet and Lawn Tennis Club. By 1880, croquet had vanished from the name, as tennis, which held a wider appeal because it was a little bit more of a spectator sport, made use of the club's lawns. It is no accident that two Wimbledon tennis courts fit just about perfectly into one croquet court, because the space was converted from one to the other. But croquet and Wimbledon's divorce did not stick. Croquet once again became part of the All England Club in 1899, although the order was reversed so that it became the All England Lawn Tennis and Croquet Club, although the All England Club is commonly used. When the club moved in the 1920s, croquet did not move with it, although it stayed in the official name. In the 1950s, the club once again picked up croquet, but it has remained a secondary aspect of Wimbledon. 
The club had only one croquet court until 2007. That one was removed, and then three new ones were installed in 2008. During high tennis season, the croquet players have to play elsewhere. Uh, they usually, I heard it described, they they do like four kind of open uh, tournaments in the club each year and four away, and the away ones are scheduled when uh, tennis is in its season because those lawns that would be used for croquet are used as practice areas for the more prevalent sports. It's the very brief glimpse at croquet <laughs> in our history. Uh, we'll talk about the fact Here's the thing I know, that if you are in England, they do the accent differently, so it's croquet rather than croquet. Uh, this, but, is, <laughs> this is like whether it's Marriott or Marriott. Right. Uh, <laughs> precisely. Uh, but, yeah, it's a, a, a fun little I'm, – I'm thinking of spring already, so it was a fun adventure to – Consider going outside and playing on the lawn. Yeah, I um, as as uh, I was reading through this outline, I read a really interesting article about the spread of England or the spread of croquet through uh, like places that England or Britain had colonized, um, and like its introduction into Egypt, and then Egypt becoming like the dominant home <laughs> of croquet yeah. players. Um, so, like, it's a game that has had a whole trajectory beyond its origins. Oh, yes. Yeah, we, I, I stuck to the very European kind of developmental rules because once it yeah. passed out of there, it exploded and became, like, a worldwide sport. I definitely did not get into the the more competitive. There are not very many, but there are professional croquet players today that that is their full-time thing. Mm-hmm. Um is just one of the many evolutions of yeah. of any sport that becomes popular, I think. Yeah. Do you have some listener mail for us also? I do. This one is very exciting to me because I am selfish. Oh! <laughs> this is from our listener, Erica, who writes, Hello, Holly and Tracy. I am grateful for your work researching, writing, and talking. I'm a public school English teacher in Halifax, Nova Scotia, and I've used your podcast about the Halifax explosion as a mentor text. Thank you for being an educator, Erica. Uh, I know that Holly appreciates fashion, so here is a unique book related to clothing and costumes from three eras with a taste of Nova Scotia and influence of Paris. Enjoy. Uh, She sent this beautiful book, called Transatlantique, and it is the art of fashion and costume design in Paris and Halifax. There is a lot of really fabulous um, art in here. There's a lot of um, poire action going on. It's beautiful, 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 and it makes you want to run home and make pretty outfits. (laughs) So thank you so much, Erica. It's absolutely gorgeous. I'm going to pour over it. I may take it on my next trip so I can just gawk at it in flight. I always love it when I get little fashion books. She also had some cute, um, the postcard that she said that she wrote the note on, uh, she has a PS on. She said, on the front is a dachshund, which reminds me of my dog Duke. He is a mix of dachshund, beagle, and bloodhound, which to me sounds like the cutest combo on the planet. So Duke, I hope you're having a great day. Uh, If you would like to write to us, you can do so at historypodcast at iheartradio.com. You can also find us everywhere on social media as Missed in History. And we encourage you to subscribe to the show. You can do that on the iHeartRadio app, at Apple Podcasts, or wherever it is you like to listen. Stuff You Missed in History Class is a production of iHeartRadio's How Stuff Works. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. <laughs> 